are talking about one of my favorite topics. And like the more I think about it and the more I learn about because I'm really into cycle health right now and like learning about all the different phases and I'm like the healthcare system, like we really just get pushed aside. Like there's never anything about pelvic floor health. There's never anything about like cycle health, like hormones. It's very, it's like you have to do your own like research on it and you have to advocate for it. It's not like your doctor is going to bring up these questions. You know what I mean? Which is wild to me. It's true. It's crazy. And it's because and it, it's always things that affect women, yep. it seems. So hopefully the healthcare system, you know, gets their shit together eventually. But for now, I will just keep doing these podcast episodes and hope that everybody gets the information. Um, so yes, today we're talking about the pelvic floor. And the idea that it like having a tense pelvic floor can be the issue. And I think oftentimes people assume if they're experiencing pelvic floor issues like leakage or whatever it might be, they assume that they're weak. So can you talk a little bit about how it's not always weakness that's the problem? And in fact, it can be the opposite, that it's too tight. For sure. So you're so right. It's such a common misconception or misunderstanding of how the body works, how this private, personal, hidden part of our body that we don't talk about, we don't look at it, we don't touch it about how it works, right? So it's kind of understandable that we don't understand um, and that we assume that if something is going wrong down there, like like you mentioned, if we're leaking and you know, we don't want to be, um, or if we're having other kinds of issues and the problem must be that our muscles down there are not strong enough. Um, so it's so interesting when I, when I see clients and I work with people in person, I ask them like, why do you think you're having this issue? Right. If they're coming to me with whatever type of pelvic floor problem, why do you think you're having this problem? Nine times out of 10, it's, I guess maybe my muscles aren't so weak. Oh, I guess like, I don't know. I haven't done my Kegels. I should be doing my Kegels. So there, it's, it's such a common misunderstanding. Um, so I love chatting about why it's a misunderstanding. So for sure, there are cases, absolutely, when if the muscles are not strong enough, they will not be able to do their job properly, right? So if we take a step back and we try to understand what does our actual pelvic floor do for us? What do our pelvic floor muscles, what do they do? What's the role they play for us? Well, they need to be able to contract and close the appropriate holes down there so that we're not leaking pee or poo or farts that, but also at the same time, those muscles have to be able to kind of relax and open so that when we do want to pee or we do want to poo or we do want to fart, we can do those things. So the muscles have to be able to contract at the right time and relax at the right time. Um, the muscles have to be able to, you know, contract appropriately so that we can experience sexual pleasure. When we have an orgasm, that's a involuntary rapid contraction of all of our pelvic floor muscles. That's what we feel. Um, and also at the same token, if we want to have penetrative sex, we need to be able to allow something to go into the vaginal opening, right? And same token, if we want to be able to use a tampon or menstrual cup, or we go to have a pap test, like we need to be able to allow something to go inside. So you're getting the drift here, right? Like they, they have to be able to contract. They have to be able to relax. They have to do it at the right time. They have to do these things often involuntarily. Like when we sit on the toilet, I don't know about you, but when I sit on the toilet, I'm like, okay, muscles, let go. Like it just, it's a reflexive action that happens. So the muscles are pretty unique down there in the sense that they need to do part of their job automatically and in anticipation of what we may be doing or maybe about to do. They also, there's a voluntary component to these muscles too, right? When we do want to contract them or to do exercises or whatnot. So anyhow, there are certainly cases where if the muscles around the sphincter, so, you know, the hole that the pee and the poo come out of, if those muscles aren't strong enough, Absolutely. We could have cases where we do something like sneeze or jump or cough and those muscles are not strong enough to with to kind of counteract that pressure. Yeah, we're going to have a leak. But in many cases, the resting tone or like the baseline of the muscle fibers down there, instead of being like weak and loosey goosey is in fact, in many people that I'm 
you know, coming across these days is overactive or sort of too much tension. I think you use the word tense, right? Like there's just too much activity in the muscles at baseline. So in that case, we will see different types of problems. Some of them might be, see, might be the same as what we'll see if our pelvic floor muscles are too weak and some of them might be different. So for example, leaks are something that can happen when our pelvic floor muscles are too tense or overactive. The muscle can't tighten anymore to close a hole. So pee comes out. Um, but when we have overactive or kind of tight muscles down there, we could have things like back pain or hip pain. We could have pelvic pain. We could have like the inability to let anything in. So if it's penetrative sex or if it's a, a tampon, anything, right? Like there are cases where muscles just don't even allow that if our muscles are too tight. Um, so there's lots of stuff like that that can show up that is completely the opposite of a muscle that's too weak or too loose, if you will. My issue was that I was too tight. And I remember going to see a pelvic floor physio and like my Kegels were out of this world, like so strong. But right. where I was struggling was, and if you're listening and you have never seen a pelvic floor physio, it's literally an internal exam and they're checking out all the muscles in what would, what would you call it? The vaginal canal or something yeah, like, exactly yeah. like one or two fingers inside the vagina or inside the rectum. Yeah. Yeah. And so they have you do a Kegel while their fingers are inside so they can feel if you're doing it properly. And so my Kegel was incredible, but it was hard for me to release it. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. that was because if I had never seen a pelvic floor physio, maybe I would have just assumed like, oh, I'm weak. I need to just keep doing Kegels as much as possible. But that was that wouldn't have helped me because she then taught me like the breathing exercises to breathe, which is crazy. You 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 hear breathing exercises and you're like, oh, OK, like like I can't breathe. It took me a <laughs> long time to yeah. be able to breathe into my pelvic floor and to understand how to do that. So she really taught me different exercises to do so that I would get better at releasing it and not being so tense. Because once she had explained that to me, I would catch myself doing dishes or something. And once I was mindful about it, I was like, Renee, why are you clenching <laughs> your butt and your vagina right now? <laughs> yeah. Like, just let it go. And so, yeah, I, I was shocked. I knew I wasn't weak down there, but I was like, what is going on? Because I never really experienced any kind of symptoms until Milo was about 18 months old. And I started to leak if I would like jump or sneeze when I was trying to hold pee in. And then yeah, after working on all that stuff, like I haven't had issues since. So yeah, that's important to to keep in mind, you're not necessarily weak. But at the same time, if you're tensing all the time, you're, it's hard for you to then use those muscles when you have to because they're so like tight and then you sneeze and they're like, oh, fuck this. Like I can't, <laughs> I can't yeah, exa anymore. That's exactly. They're like, I'm out. I'm done. Because if you think about it without getting like too technical in the way that muscle fibers actually work in order to have a muscle that provides a strong contraction, and this applies to any muscle in our body, not just our pelvic floor muscles. In order to have a good contraction, the muscle has to have length in it first. So if you don't have good length in the muscle or like the ability to let it go, then it's not going to have very good tension that's able to be generated by that muscle, right? So, um, and like in your case where you said, you know, you know that you can contract it quite well. It was quite strong, but you had a hard time letting go and you were catching yourself like clenching your butthole or your vag like <laughs> randomly, which is so common. I do yes. too. And it doesn't make any sense. It's because it's kind of like this subconscious thing, you know, like we, we hold our pelvic floor is one of those places in our body, like not the only place, but one of those places in our bodies that we hold stuff. We hold, we hold like not physical stuff, not like a pocket. No, I guess, I guess you could, but, but we hold, we hold tension. We hold stress. We hold anxiety. Like we hold, we manifest like physical signs of stuff, you know, like 
our jaw. Like, you know, you tell people, oh, do you clench your jaw at nighttime? People are like, oh, yeah, I do. I grind my teeth. I have a night card. That's such a logical leap, you know, like I do more of this when I'm stressed or I have shoulder and neck pain when I'm stressed. Like, why don't we get that? We do the same types of thing in our pelvic floor. Um, but that that is 100% true. Um, and we, we don't want that baseline to be like so tense. If you think about your situation where you're mentioning that when you jump before, when you jumped and your bladder was like a little bit full that you would end up leaking. If you think about like your pelvic floor, what we want it to be like is like a trampoline, right? So when you're jumping on a trampoline, you jump on it and the trampoline gives a little bit and then it kind of rebounds and helps you to jump back up, right? That's like this bouncy, it gives and it takes. Now, if you have a really rigid or a tense pelvic floor, imagine that it's like a concrete floor. You jump on it, there's nowhere for it to go. There's no give. So if you think about your bladder kind of like jumping onto a really hard floor, there's no kind of like cushion for it to kind of be absorbed almost like that force. Um, so sometimes that's a good visual for people too, why we actually want some length and movement in our pelvic floor, just like any other muscle. You mentioned, and I have never thought about this before, you mentioned about an orgasm being contraction of the pelvic floor like duh now I get that but I've never really put two and two together so really? can people no yeah like I, I never like I think about pelvic floor stuff a lot obviously like just because of what I do and I never yeah. really put two and two together that well so my question is I don't even know <laughs> I'm like making up the answer here if somebody has pelvic floor issues, can they then experience issues or yes. like with their orgasm? Oh, yeah. see, no one has yeah. ever mentioned this before. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you're not alone. You're not alone. Like we just we just don't think about it. And yeah, that's the thing about the pelvic floor. Like it when it's doing what it's supposed to do, Renee, we're not supposed to think about it. It's fine. Yeah. We're not supposed to think about all these things. But it's when the wheels start falling off the bus that we start to try to figure out why and sometimes it's obvious sometimes it's not but yes some people can have um, pelvic floor muscles that could be you know like really really weak or really really tense or overactive and as a result they can't achieve an orgasm or their orgasm might be super duper weak or you know like the buildup to a climax right like they just they can never get there um perhaps because those muscles are are there's not enough contractility there's it's not available well, if there was ever a reason to work on your pelvic floor, I never thought about this before. This is like, oh, man. Yeah, better orgasms. Mm -hmm. Seriously. So obviously, most of the people listening to this podcast have children or especially young children. Mm -hmm. So how does and I think there's a lot of misconception maybe with you know, your pelvic floor would only be affected if you gave birth vaginally, which is not the case. So how does pregnancy, vaginal birth, and even somebody that had a C-section, like how does all of those things affect your pelvic floor? That's a good question. So well, firstly, when we're pregnant, our pelvic floor is affected end of story, right? When our when we're pregnant, our pelvic floor is under so much more load and strain and has to do so much more from the support standpoint, right? It part of the job of the pelvic floor like earlier on when we were chatting, I talked about how it has to like relax and contract, let things in, let things out at the right time. But a major role of those muscles is also to provide support to the pelvic organs to play a role in the stability of like our body, to be a part of that deepest core unit, um, like not the six pack abs per se, but the, the core, the abdominal muscles underneath there, like our pelvic floor is part of that inner core type of a unit. So when we're pregnant, there's a lot of downwards strain and kind of ongoing force that's going on the pelvic floor that's very different from when that person was not pregnant. Not to mention the fact that, you know, obvious statement, but the belly, the abdominal wall is stretching a lot. So the core support from the front is also a little bit compromised. So that whole inner core unit that is really the pelvic floor and the abdominal wall and um, the diaphragm, which is our breathing muscle on the top, it's all very impacted 
by pregnancy. So after a baby is born, however that baby is born, um, the pelvic floor is kind of like, I don't like using this word, but I guess it's kind of what it is. Like it's a little bit stretched out or like a little bit, the fibers are stretched out or looser um, and needs some time to kind of come back to its normal resting length and, and position, both the abdominal wall and the pelvic floor. So pregnancy itself will impact the pelvic floor. And in fact, Pregnancy is often when many people start to experience some kind of pelvic floor dysfunction. It's not uncommon to leak during pregnancy. It's not uncommon to develop hemorrhoids during pregnancy or birth. Um, it's not uncommon to have pelvic pain or, or back pain in pregnancy. So pregnancy is also one of those times where dysfunction starts to show up. Um, now, postpartum, if we talk about someone that's had a vaginal delivery, so that's a ton of force and pressure that 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 person is putting downwards to get the baby out of their body, um, that a lot of pressure can result in pelvic floor stuff like hemorrhoids, other pressure related stuff like pelvic organ prolapse, which is when one of our pelvic organs like our bladder or our rectum or our uterus, they just sit a little bit lower in the pelvic cavity than they used to sit. Um, so that's super common in um, after vaginal birth. Um, and then also different types of trauma to the actual pelvic floor in terms of perineal tears or tears of, you know, kind of other areas of the vulva, um, which would obviously need to maybe repair on their own or to be sutured or stitched up. So there's like, you know, a lot of stuff that happens after vaginal delivery that we can really clearly be like, oh, I see how the pelvic floor might need some time to heal after a vaginal birth. Um, but I think that where people start to think that, oh, if I have a C-section, I'm sparing or I'm like protecting my pelvic floor kind of like, yeah, you're maybe not going to have those pressure related things like hemorrhoids or pelvic organ prolapse from pushing for so long or a perineal tear. Um, but a C-section is a major abdominal surgery. Um, and it doesn't spare you from all of the changes that happened during those nine or 10 months of pregnancy. Um, and if you ended up having a C-section after trying to labor or trying to push, then you could still have some of those like pressure related things. Like just because a baby didn't actually exit your vagina, but you pushed for a little while until maybe the situation changed and you had to decide to go for a C-section along with your medical team, you could have some of those pressure things and also have a C-section and recovery from that major abdominal surgery. So Pelvic floor is kind of like never spared. <laughs> if you're pregnant, it's never spared. Seriously. Is it? I remember, obviously, after I gave birth vaginally, and it was like, I was shocked. And I didn't have, uh, like, my labor delivery. Everything was probably very average. You know, I didn't have any, like, major issues or anything. And I'm pretty in shape, you know, before giving birth. So there's that too. And I still remember thinking like, wow, this is insane. Like the trauma to the area and just like the recovery afterwards. And I was like, how does nobody truly explain what this feels like? Like I just from like dabbing down there after I would go pee and it took me like 10 minutes to go pee like so swollen so painful like oh my gosh it was wild but is it similar to like let's say you go do a big workout and you like yeah. really like strain <laughs> let's just say like your bicep yeah. and so it takes a while for that to recover after is it like similar to to that because I had lots of things going on like the first few days after giving birth like I could not hold in a fart and I was like <laughs> I have to go bring him to the doctor like I, I can't sit down I can't hold in farts like no this is not okay but yeah. after a couple weeks it slowly starts to get better so is it similar to like a major workout where you really work out a muscle I mean, I would say no, but in some cases, maybe, right? Like I think it would, there's too many factors, right? So if you, for example, have a really fast delivery, right? Like you're not pushing for that long, a couple, you know, you hear those stories, a couple pushes and the baby was out. Like maybe that's really great for you. And that was not a lot of effort and a lot of pressure that you had to generate to like push the baby out because there's a few pushes and he was out and you had no trauma, like no um, perineal tears or didn't even suture. 
maybe that person is going to recover much more quickly than the person who was pushing for 90 minutes, ended up with maybe forceps or vacuum assisted delivery. Maybe they had an episiotomy. Maybe they had a third degree perineal tear where they needed some nice stitches to, to suture it up. And they had some trouble more than just a few days holding in their farts and their poop, you know, like you can't, you can't, I, I can't tell you the answer to that, but I, I'm going to lean towards a no, it's not just like a strenuous workout, but everyone's timeline of recovery is going to be super different. Um, also, you know, how you are going into it, just like you mentioned, you were like in good shape, right? Like you took care of yourself, you're strong and all these things that does play a role in how we recover per, postpartum. Um, you know, so I think there's too many factors, but I think like, no, <laughs> it wouldn't be <laughs> like a, like a rough workout. Yeah. It's true because you don't like slice open your bicep when you're, do you know what I mean? It's more like trauma as yeah. opposed to you're just working the muscle. I guess working the muscle would be like you're doing Kegels, whereas this is more like trauma to the area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is like a lot of pressure. This is a lot of like micro tears in some cases, best cases, right? There's, there's there's a lot that's going on. And then, you know, comparing it to something like a workout is not taking into consideration all the other like biopsychosocial bio -psycho things that are happening too. So yeah, there's stuff happening to the body that can look different for each person. All the hormonal stuff that's happening, mm. the like the social support that some people do or don't have that drastically impacts so many things, including their recovery postpartum, you know, their mental health state going in and after, you know, there's so many things that are so complex and so nuanced that no, it, it can't, it can't just be simplified to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Pain tolerance. Yeah. Breastfeeding challenges, you know, like if you wanted to breastfeed and you're trying and it, it, that's a super challenging thing that nobody talks about um as mm -hmm. well so it's yeah I remember just being like shocked I was like wow the thing is like giving birth and having a baby is very common and I guess because women do it it's just kind of like oh okay yeah everybody does it like like, let's not really talk about it. Like, get over it. Like, it happens. People do it. Millions of people do it every day. You know what I mean? It's kind of minimized. And then when you go through it yourself, you're like, I was shocked. And I was thinking about everyone I knew that had kids. And I was like, they did this. Like, they went through this. Like, this is what this is. And I remember just, yeah. It, and, and then you feel like you can't express just how big of a deal it is because society doesn't treat it as a big deal. So I know it's, it's so tricky. And like, I don't know, I feel like people are going to get mad that I'm about to say this, but sometimes when you see like, you know, at the Super Bowl, Rihanna performed, it was like amazing yeah. performance, like nine months postpartum pregnant. Like she's so capable. The human body is crazy and amazing. And that is so admirable. I was cheering the whole time. But then there's some of us that are nine months postpartum and not with another child. And like, we can't, we can't even imagine doing something like that. We're barely trying to get it together. So sometimes I feel like when we see in the media, these like big things, which like glorify these amazing accomplishments of those particular women who are able to do that, it makes those of us who are not able to be that or I wasn't that when I was nine months pregnant, when nine months postpartum, it makes, it can make us feel all these emotions, you know? So I'm feeling, I feel a little bit conflicted about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. I was not performing at the Super Bowl when Milo was nine months old. I don't think I'll have to look back on my, my calendar, but I don't think I was. <laughs> I was like, probably crying on the couch <laughs> I know oh. I was not I was not no I had no <laughs> if people I want to kind of go over the most common issues related to a tight pelvic floor yeah because maybe people are listening and they're like hmm like that could be me so what if somebody has that like tense all the time uh what are the most common issues that they might experience I would say the, like the top issues or the top complaints that come in that end up being like caused at least in part by 
pelvic floor muscles that are a little bit too active would be things like long-standing hip pain or back pain or pelvic pain. Um, leaks, like you mentioned, that's very, very common. Um, you know, and that's one of those huge misconceptions, right? Like I leak because I'm weak. Um, when really in reality, a lot of us are weaking because <laughs> leaking, leaking because we uh, don't have enough like give in the muscles. We don't have enough length in those muscles. So that's a huge one. And then pain with any kind of penetration or the inability to allow any kind of penetration. Um, those would be like the top things. So like painful tampon use, like I can use it, but like, I don't love it. Or I can do a pap test, like I'll go and do it because I need to, but you know, I'm like gripping the table or I'm dreading it, you know, sex is kind of always painful, but I thought that's the way it's supposed to be. So these types of things are often like, yeah, those are the, the main things that I'm seeing these days with people who end up having overactive uh, pelvic floor muscles. So where, when you say like low back pain or pelvic pain, is there, can you just explain like where the pain is or what it might feel like? Because I feel like, like low back pain is probably very common it is in so women. common. Yeah, yeah, it is so common. And it's so common in the whole general population, you know, like, I wish I remember the stat, like how many people like suffer with low back pain. So the way I usually like describe it is kind of like if you've had this like nagging, chronic low back pain, so not like you, you know, you pulled your back just the other day. But if you've had like, you know, back pain for years on and off, it's kind of always there, maybe off to one side, maybe down into your butt, you know, um, and traditional stuff like massages, or like going for like, traditional physio where maybe you get some exercises if that stuff isn't fixing your back pain long term then it's always good to take a look inside the pelvic floor because the pelvic floor muscles sure they're on the bottom of the pelvis they make up the floor of the pelvis um, but they don't work in isolation if you think about what the pel where the pelvis is it connects at the back to your actual spine right the spine the bottom of the lumbar spine or the low back gets into the sacrum, which is this triangle bone that fits right into the back of the pelvis. Um, so it, the muscles of the low back, the muscles that support the outside of the pelvis, so like our hip muscles, even if you think about like your glutes or like the muscles of your butt, all of these muscles that stabilize our hips, that help to support and stabilize our spine, they are so interconnected from like a connective tissue and a fascia standpoint with the pelvic floor, but also from a functional standpoint too. So the low back pain, you might be feeling it in your low back, but it could be that your pelvic floor muscles are contributing to that pain. Perhaps on one side, they're a little bit too tight, or perhaps on, you know, the the back muscles are overcompensating for pelvic floor muscles that are not doing the right thing at the right time. And in fact, some of the deep muscles of the hip, the muscles that help to rotate the hip joint in and out, so, you know, move your leg in and out, um, those muscles can actually be accessed from inside the pelvic floor as well. So some of these muscles that stabilize the spine and stabilize our hips are really deep muscles that we can't really always get to from like a massage on the outside or superficial stretching. So usually it's that. It's that like long standing back pain that nothing really works for. You can live and move and survive it, but you know, there is a huge correlation between that and, and pelvic floor dysfunction. Do pelvic floor physios ever do work internally to uh, like release muscles? Yeah, exactly. So uh -huh. that is like one of, yeah, it's one of the treatment options for sure is to do internal work. So you had kind of explained what it would be like to have an assessment, right? There's one or two fingers in inside the vaginal or the rectal opening. And that's how we can feel and assess the muscles by asking, you know, the patient to do bunch of different things. Um, and then if there is a muscle that is tender or is overactive, we could do some internal self, like internal release type work to help that teach people how to do it on their own. There's like pelvic wands that can be used to kind of do that sort of self release. Um, but yeah, it is a treatment option for sure. I like that. Can a pelvic floor be both tight and weak at the same time? Because maybe people are like, I know I don't do Kegels very well. You know, maybe they're confused. Can So can it be both? Yeah, for sure. A tight muscle, if we think about it really at the foundation, a tight muscle is not really a functional muscle. Um, and a tight muscle is often a weak muscle. 
because when a muscle is already like short, so if we like look at my bicep, right? If my bicep is flexed, so my elbow is totally bent and that's a shortened position of my bicep compared to when my elbow is straightened out, my bicep is in a lengthened position. So if my bicep is always held in this shortened position, so my elbow being bent, if I need to generate force or like bend my elbow anymore, contract my bicep anymore, I don't have that much more space to go. So the muscle fibers themselves, when they're like tight, if you will, they don't have that much more space to get any tighter. And a muscle needs to have length to generate that type of attention, to de- generate like that contraction really well. So oftentimes a tight muscle is actually a weak muscle. I feel like I understand why in Pilates, the teachers are always like, lengthen. I'm like, now I get it. (laughs) You need both, right? You need that balance. You need to move any muscle, including your pelvic floor muscles, through the full range of motion. They need to be able to be nicely relaxed. They need to be able to strongly contract. So yeah, just like any other muscle, you need to lengthen. (laughs) Okay, so we're going to talk about different things that can benefit us when it comes to our pelvic floor. And like I said before, people might hear things like breath work and be like, yeah, but like, how does that benefit us? So let's talk first about breath work. How how does that or like, what can people do with like for breath work for their pelvic floor? How does it help us? Okay. So breath work is honestly the foundation of pelvic health. And this is why. So I had just mentioned that just like any other muscle in your body, your pelvic floor muscles need to be able to be totally relaxed and to be able to strongly contract, right? They need that full range of motion. The really cool thing about the way that we breathe is that we can influence the movement of our pelvic floor simply by diaphragmatically breathing, Um, which essentially is not the way that we breathe when we're like talking and just like at rest, but intentionally breathing in a way that we're involving our diaphragm in that inhale and exhale, that can influence the movement of our pelvic floor down and up. And it's because the diaphragm, which is our breathing muscle, it sits like under our rib cage and our pelvic floor, which sits like under it, parallel to it at the bottom of our pelvis, those two guys are best friends, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. Ideally, when one moves, the other should move too. So when we take a nice deep breath in and we feel our rib cage expand all the way around, we feel our belly gently fill, what's happening there is that our diaphragm is moving down. It's dropping down. That dropping down of the diaphragm creates pressure in our belly. And that pressure goes down and it kind of encourages the pelvic floor also to drop or to kind of relax or let go. So ideally, if we could establish proper diaphragmatic breathing, so not just breathing into your belly, but allowing the rib cage to expand, allowing like the bat, everything, like this 360 expansion of the torso, if you will, that can encourage that movement of the pelvic floor. So if you're someone, like you mentioned, you are right, like your pelvic floor was often just in this like, lifted overactive position just randomly throughout the day if you're someone that could learn how to use the power of that diaphragmatic breath to really let your pelvic floor go that's the pillar that's like you're taking your pelvic floor through like a range of motion by simply breathing so it's super powerful not to mention the fact that it's a really wonderful way to settle down our nervous system when we breathe diaphragmatically we can move our nervous system from like the sympathetic state where we're stressed and where it's a fight, flight, freeze, bond kind of, you know, that panic situation into the more parasympathetic nervous system, which is more like rest and relax. We can move ourselves from the stress state to the more calm state simply by breathing diaphragmatically. It's a really powerful tool. And if we kind of go back to what we were talking about earlier, how the pelvic floor is one of those places that we hold stress and anxiety and stuff like that, we it's like a really neat tool that we can have in our toolbox to manage like our state of mind too so breathing is the foundation so that would be honestly mission critical for every person is to figure out how to breathe and let the pelvic floor drop and let go as we inhale Mm -hmm. it took practice for me and I think I was a person that was constantly just like shallow breaths you know and so yeah I remember when I started doing yoga 
and they do a, a bunch of breath work and yoga. Like I couldn't figure it out. They'd be like, breathe in for four seconds. I'm like, I can't even breathe in for two seconds. Like I'm like, <gasps> like doing these little short breaths. But once you practice and I found it helpful to do the breath work with uh, the physio because she would put her hand on my belly and like, it was like a visual, like I tried to lift her hand, you know, because yes. I was so used to breathing in my chest and not in my diaphragm, I guess, or like lower. So yeah. And then once you start breathing, like taking deep breaths, I remember even now, like I do it every once in a while, we'll be driving or something. And I'm like, <gasps> Like, just take, like, big breaths. And my husband's like, what? What's wrong? And I'm like, nothing. I'm just freaking breathing. Like, it feels good. <laughs> it is, honestly. It's super powerful. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I feel like it, I used to think that it was so patronizing when, you know, like, if if you're upset or if you're angry or then someone's like, just come down, take a deep breath. Or, like, I would hear myself saying that to people. Um, I feel like it's so patronizing. But, in fact, it's, like, rooted in science, right? If you take proper, slow, deep breaths, you're actually bringing your nervous system out of that, like, anger or whatever emotion you were feeling and, like, a little bit more calmed down, more grounded. So it's really, like, a wonderful tool. Um, it's really, it's a, yeah. And it, yeah. It's, you should really know how to do that. The next thing is mobility. So how do we improve the mobility of our pelvic floor? And it, it sounds funny because it's like, how do I improve the mobility of like, you don't, it's not like your arm where you feel like you can stretch it and stuff, right? So how do we go about doing that? It's a good question. I mean, mobility of the pelvic floor can look like a lot of different things, but really, in my opinion, the mobility of the pelvic floor includes all of the joints that are kind of like around it and that affect the movement of the pelvic floor muscles themselves, right? So the hips and the spine and like the inner thighs and all of the areas that kind of connect into the pelvis and around the pelvis, you know, working on mobility is really, it should be kind of like fundamental in the sense that you know, it, like in your case, right? Like doing more strengthening activities for your pelvic floor would not serve you. It would not probably make your leaking situation better because you were not leaking because your muscles were weak. You needed, yeah, you needed more length in those muscles or more movement in those muscles. So mobility should really be like one of the first things that we address. Even if you have good mobility, you can benefit from more. So mobility work for the pelvic floor could look like you know, stretches of the pelvic floor, mobility, or like moving in and out of positions to stretch the inner thighs, to stretch the glutes or like the butt, um, to stretch the spine, the spine and the pelvis, they really are super connected in terms of their function and their different movements. So taking a, a good look at the hips and the spine, um, all of that stuff is really important when it comes to pelvic floor mobility, really anything in and around that area, not just like, let me stretch my vag, let me sit here in like a deep squat for five minutes and that will stretch my pelvic floor. It will, but <laughs> it's not going to really be enough to give lasting change and functional change too. Because if you think about mobility, it's like moving with control and intention from like one position to another position. So when you're doing that, yes, little by little, maybe you can move a little bit deeper into each position, but you are like, there's a lot of brain work happening there too, right? You're like moving with control in and out of these patterns. You're working on the joint health, right? So lubricating those joints. Um, you're working on the muscles that stabilize. Like there's so much going on there. It's almost like really minimalistic to be like, it's just stretching. It's not, it's so much more. And the next is core strength and pelvic floor strength, which I think people assume like, oh, Kegels, but I'm just, I'm assuming there's more to it than just that. For sure. So definitely like, you know, there's some schools of thought where people are like, nobody should ever do Kegels. Like nobody needs Kegels. Yeah. There's like, you know, like on the Instagram, there's, there's a lot of people that are anti-Kegel. I'm not anti-Kegel per se, but it's not going to be like my first thing that I go to with people. We're going to address a lot of other things. We're going to look outside of the box, you know? Um, but pelvic floor and core strengthening, Honestly, they're sort of one in the same in the sense that if you are using your breath, right, to move your pelvic floor as you inhale, then you can learn to use your breath as you exhale to gently activate the pelvic floor 
in the very deep fibers of your abdominal wall. So the transversus abdominis, which is like this stabilizing muscle of the spine. Um, it connects from your pelvis all the way up to your ribs. And when you activate that transversus abdominis, it kind of gives you like, it makes your belly flatter. It sort of gives you this rigidity in your torso. So if you're able to kind of exhale and feel the pelvic floor activate or lift a little bit and turn on those deep stabilizing abs, that's core work just in itself. Um, so really, once you've established some good mobility, or at least you're addressing that mobility, you've figured out how your breath can move your pelvic floor in the first place, then for sure, gaining strength in your core, including your pelvic floor, will help with like function. It can help with back pain for sure. It can help with function if like leaking, for example, we keep going back to that, but like if you're leaking because you might have some weakness, sure, strengthen your muscles, right? Do you do Pilates? Or have I don't you? Per- yeah, I don't currently do Pilates, but I was trained in Matt in Reformer as an instructor like 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. So like, it's so interesting because we'll be laying on the Reformer and the smallest little movement, like they'll just have us with our like feet up on the jump board and it'll be like, okay, no, make sure your lower back is glued to the board, you know, because we have a tendency to like lift it up. So just switching that like when you're doing the jumps off the jump board is like wild it's the smallest little movement and it makes the biggest difference and all of a sudden your entire pelvic floor and your core is like activated it's wild that's the thing. it's because yeah. our bodies will like do the easiest thing that's the thing our body will compensate and like make things easier it's just what our body does so when you're corrected like if you're in a nice like small group setting or one-on-one they're finding those things for you and they're correcting them. I'm actually like really scared to try Pilates because I haven't done it in so long. And right now my movement of choice is like lifting heavy stuff. So I know that I will leave there crying. Like I could, you know, deadlift and squat and snatch like heavy weights, but I would cry after a Pilates session. So I'm scared. It's so funny because it's so true. Like, oh, okay, I have to do these like big you know, like muscle groups, like squats and stuff like, sure, I'll do them all day. But you asked me (laughs) to squeeze this little fucking like nothing ring. And like my shoulders are giving out like there's no weight involved. I literally just have to hold my arms up like with this ring and I'm like crying. It's because it's all the little intricate muscles that we don't use. It's all those like stabilizing muscles. You're holding them, you know, it's like endurance training as well. Like you're not using the muscles that are going to explode and give you those like quick movements. You are doing that. You're pulsing. You're, 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 it's hard (laughs) shit. (laughs) The other day it was like lay on the box. So like you're laying on this box, which reaches from like your hip bones to like under your boobs, let's say. Yeah. And like, we had to like Superman out and she's like, okay, now like flutter your arms and your legs. I was like, Jesus, like, Lord help me. It seems like the most basic thing, but my lower back was like, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's so good. And it's all these like functional movements, which is why I love it. But yeah, it's little muscles. They'll get you. They'll get you Um, for sure. My next question, can you explain what a guided body scan is and why it's important? Okay. So have you ever done any kind of meditation or like a guided relaxation? In yoga? Yes. And I'm very bad at it, but I'm getting better. It's really hard to slow down sometimes. It's really hard. Um, I'm the same way. I would be that like obnoxious person that would go to like I used to have a good life men- membership many years ago and I would go to like the yoga class and then right before the end, I would like roll up my mat and I would leave because I don't have time to like lie there and <laughs> to think about my, think about my thoughts and feel my things. Yeah. So anyways, the first so, time I had to like be quiet in a yoga class and it was like, everybody lay down and close your eyes. I was like, what? Like what? Like raging anxiety. And I'm like looking around the room. I'm like, I can't be still and quiet, but it's important and I'm getting better. So go ahead with the, the Good scan. For you. Good for you. So um, a guided body scan is a really nice way to have someone like a voice, right? Guide you to literally scan your body. So it's kind of an act of mindfulness, if you will. You can call it a form of meditation if you want. But really what it is, is a way for you to 
bring your attention from one body part to the other, bring your attention to your breath and kind of strengthen the connection between your mind and your body. Um, that kind of mind muscle connection, if you've ever heard of that, like being present and being aware of different sensations in our body and the way that our body works, that's super powerful in itself, especially, you know, these days, your experience that you're sharing about not like being good at this kind of stuff. And my experience of just avoiding it, like these are common, we live these busy lives, we don't want to be there with our thoughts, we don't want to pay attention. So um, guided body scans and any kind of mindfulness, this type of practice is really wonderful, again, for our nervous system and to help settle any kind of, you know, stress related stuff. And again, I think that it's a really important part of it's something that I, you know, routinely recommend to my, my pelvic floor physiotherapy clients is try a body scan. Um, it's a really important piece of this whole puzzle. Um, you know, when we're dealing with pelvic health concerns, it's not the same as a sprained ankle, for example, not to minimize how disruptive and painful and, you know, challenging it can be to rehab from a sprained ankle. But when people come in and they're dealing with these really personal issues that maybe they haven't shared with anybody before, or they're in these really delicate life stages of pregnancy or postpartum or entering into peri or menopause, like these things are not just the problem is not just what's happening to them. The problem is not just that their pelvic floor is weak and therefore they're leaking or whatever it is. There's so many other things going on and especially dealing with a lot of people who are mothers. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's high levels of stress and anxiety these days. And so I always will recommend body scans. I'll always recommend like, just try a three minute body scan. And I, I like to give, um, you know, little routines for them to, to listen to. Um, it's a really important piece of the puzzle. Again, going back to the fact that our pelvic floor is a place that we often hold a lot of stuff. Um, you know, how we manage stress and anxiety, how well we sleep, our overall resiliency, it all impacts our pelvic health. It's not just our pelvic floor and what it does for us. So you created a super accessible program for people to improve their pelvic health, basically. Can you tell us about the program? If people sign up, what what do they have access to um, and where they can find it? Sure. So I created the Pelvic Floor Mobility Program and I created this based on, like, I've been a physio for, you know, 13 years or so now. And these days I only work mainly with women um, with pelvic, only with pelvic health concerns. And I kept seeing kind of like the same thing over and over again in the sense that we're seeing the same kind of issues where I, I'm experiencing I'm having the same conversations with people that it's really expensive to come into public for physio or people would reach out to me on Instagram and say like, I live somewhere where there, I don't have access to someone or I don't have benefits. Is there something that I can do? And I wanted to create something that would sort of take away a lot of the financial burden that comes with going to see someone in person takes away the geographical burden, right? Like if you don't live near someone or if you're you don't have child care. You know, I wanted to make it easy for people to have access to quality education and movement in a really supported and guided way. So I created this mobility program, which basically covers all of those like pieces of the pelvic health puzzle that we just talked about. So there's over 30 routines, which take people through breath work, how to even where to start, how to start. I guide you through it. They're all follow along videos. There's chapters on mobility, all different types of mobility, so hip and spine and pelvic floor. There's um, sections on releasing the pelvic floor and stretching the pelvic floor. There is a whole chapter that's full of guided body scans, so guided body scans for someone who has an overactive pelvic floor, someone who has pelvic pain, someone who leaks, someone who has constipation. So they're kind of like specific to maybe individual concerns. And then there's a whole chapter that basically has routines that I've put together that encompass strength and mobility based on particular you know, problems, if you will. So again, if you're having like urgency and leaks, there's a routine that's going to hit all the main points there. If you're experiencing you know, some trouble with uh, pelvic organ prolapse, for example, there's a routine specifically for you. There's one for pregnancy and postpartum, peri and menopause, and so on and so forth, back pain, pelvic pain. Um, and there's a whole chapter that's just about core and pelvic floor strengthening. So how do we use our breath to kind of connect to that core? So we're talking about like lifting gently the pelvic floor and feeling those deepest abdominals come on. And how do we move through that and strengthen in a functional way? So 
most of the routines are about 10 minutes long too. So I wanted to create something that wouldn't be like, oh, I got to do 45 minutes of my you know, pelvic floor exercises today. Like no one's going to do that. I'm not even going to do that. So I wanted to make something that was like easy, low stress, like lifetime access. You buy it one time and you can use it like throughout all the different stages of your life. Um, and so, yeah, I created this awesome program and people are so far, people are really, really loving it. I'm really thrilled with the, the positive impact that it's had on people's lives. Like I knew it would because I created all of I created the program based on like my clinical experience and my years of experience as a physio, my own personal experience with my own personal pelvic health problems. Like I knew that it was good stuff, but I was really happy. Um, like the feedback from people is really great. People are like having no back pain. People are stopping, like waking up at nighttime to pee. They're managing their urgency better. They're, you know, they're preparing for birth. Like it's just really cool. It's so valuable. And like I said, like hopefully in the future, this kind of stuff will just be common. Like it's just a well-known thing that women are educated in pelvic floor health and we know how to take care of ourselves. Like it's part of, like you mentioned the cost of seeing a physio in person, like that grinds my gears. Mm -hmm. Like it should be covered. It should be included in our care as women who get pregnant and give birth or whatever, but it's not. So it's lovely that you created this and it would be a nice gift. Like this is a great gift to give someone hey, too. That's like, true. you know, you know, someone that had a baby or they're expecting like, you know, set them up for success. Maybe they'll be like, why'd you get me this? And you'll be like, oh, you'll see. <laughs> you'll see. That's actually yeah. a really good idea. This is... Oh. It would have been a good Valentine's Day gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Here, be my Valentine, and here's something to help your yeah your your pelvic floor. Um. Okay. Well, that's amazing. What's the? Is there a website where they go to to look at up the program? For sure. So you can learn more at learn dot dot co. And you'll see all the information, all the details about the program there. And um, it's like a one-time fee of 109 Canadian, which thanks to the exchange rate is like 82 bucks or something American. It's like $5 go, American. I'm going to go cry now. <laughs> 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 but yeah, um, at learn.boxwellness.co, um, you can head there. And then I made a discount code. So if they use your name, Brene, um, there's 10% off for anyone that wants to do that. Awesome. And where can they find you on Instagram? On Instagram, I'm at Box Wellness Co. Well, this was a lovely chat. So thank you for coming on again. I will mention Aaliyah has been on the podcast before. It was like a really early episode. I think it was like, like one of the like in the top 10, like the first like 10 episodes. And we talked all about pooping and pelvic floor, yeah. pooping and sex and pelvic yeah. floor. So I love talking about poop stuff. It's true. Yeah. I'm oh surprised God, I didn't too. talk about it more here, but I do like talking about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll do another one that's just about poop. Okay? Just poop. Okay. I'm here for it. Thank yeah. you for having me, Renee. It was super fun. Yes. And I'm on the roll. Yeah. 